uh, uh, um, subsidence that would have otherwise occurred. So just pointing out here that uh, this is so critical and once you know, you've know you lost um, uh, that um, ability, you can't regain it in most of these areas. And so my question is, if you look at the map, is there a way to overlay um, the Corcoran clay areas that, I, it's my understanding on subsidence that for the most part, um, uh, it is related to compression of the Corcoran clay. Um, and that in most cases you cannot regain uh, that groundwater capacity, but not in all. So uh, do you have or are you moving in the direction to overlay it with maps that would uh, put together a more a complete picture about the long-term impacts? Uh, we certainly have the capa uh, capacity to take this into a GIS and overlay it into any kind of data set, including, you know, for example, the Corcoran clay or other geologic formations. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at now is continuing this possibly for another year, depending on the cost, with the free satellite data. So this would actually be less expensive because then we would just be covering the costs of NASA staff time to process the data. But as we go forward with this, one of the limitations with the existing data set, just because of the lack of availability of the satellite data was it was very patchy. And USGS had done some work that went up to about 2007 where they did a very detailed evaluation where they compared it to the subsurface lithology, the well data, GPS data for subsidence, in other words, brought a whole suite of data sets. So the information that the INSAR provides is one piece of the puzzle to understand what's going on at a specific piece, particularly at the scale of an individual groundwater basin, you need to bring it together with all of these other resources. So our thought is we put this out in the web, we talk to the entities that are in the process of putting together groundwater management plans or forming uh, management entities and say, look, this data is available, here are the well log data that are available, or here are the well water level data that's available from the CASGEM. Uh, database and other sources, how can we help you combine this into a data set that will be useful for managing the resource in your particular area? Because you're right, in areas where you have inelastic uh, recovery or lack of recovery of the aquifer, once you've lost it, you've lost it. Great, thank you. Well, thanks. That's a card? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It seems to me that particularly for groundwater, uh, for the groundwater planning that is going on, if uh, folks have access to this and are not using it, uh, that's um, not wise. We, we would actually like to develop something like the Arizona Department of Water Resources, which actually has an operational program in which they take this information and put it on the website yeah. for anyone to see. Yeah. Their program is focused on the urban areas. Uh, and because it's focused on the urban areas where subsidence damages costs can be very large, they've been able to get contributions from the urban areas to fund the program. We're doing it in the agricultural areas where that sort of funding is less likely to be available, but we're hoping that uh, with the free satellite data, that might make it this more affordable going forward. That's a, yeah, Ari I remember Arizona's Aquifer Protection Program from way back when in the 90s. It was fascinating. Other? Um, Laurel Firestone on this item. Community Water Center. Hello. Hello, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, we wanted to take this opportunity. Um, I think you've you've heard um, at a previous hearing from residents in East Porterville that lacked has continued to lack um, water in their home at all. Um, ongoing emergency and public health emergency that no one in California should have to endure at this point, and we really need to head off more of these happening. I think this is a real great opportunity to think about ways that agencies can work together to develop um, both at the state level and between agencies to develop information that can help head off more of those. So particularly, um, you know, there's data um, around well logs and water levels that DWR has and is developing. Um, there's data that 
um, Cal EnviroScreen and OEHA have developed with a um, drinking water indicator where they've mapped out populations that are not on a centralized water system, that are on private wells or state smalls, that are really the most vulnerable, and that is East Porterville. You know, and there's many, many more. I know in the Tulare Lake Basin, we've found uh, over 60 in the Tulare Lake Basin alone that are. Um, small, very disadvantaged communities without even a centralized water system. It'd be great to overlay those um, and make that data available to look at where there's really high risk populations and we can proactively try to head off getting to the point that East Porterville is at. Um, and I think could really help the locals and counties proactively identify where that those areas may be. Um, and in addition, working with the, the state boards, um, drinking water program and, and the very small systems that only have one or two sources. Um, and, and again, combining that information and working between the agencies to see where those levels may be dropping. I know this the, the drinking water program has been really proactive with their public water systems, um, but it'd be great to to, to use this opportunity to identify where the populations are that are most vulnerable um, so we can head off this proactively. So yeah, really ahead, appreciate it. Ahead of the curve. I mean, one of the interesting things we have, we actually have to think carefully about is what we can do about it before the groundwater legislation takes effect over the long term. It, it's hard for us to go in and say you can't pump um, at the state level. I mean, we have our waste and unreasonable use authority, but it's it's, it's not a scalpel. So I look forward to thinking with you about, other than the, what we've been doing, working with OES and the governor's office to figure out how to get emergency water to folks with your incredible help. Figuring out early warning is one thing. What to do about it is a, is a, uh, is a challenge, as you see that dynamic between what Mr. Williams framed in terms of their agricultural needs and what ends up happening to these more shallow groundwater wells compared to their ag neighbors, I think we're hoping for more community engagement around a shared solution on the part of many of the agricultural water districts, some of which are stepping up, largely working with you and other groups. But I actually think there's a need for a huge community effort to figure out how to deal with these issues as opposed to it defaulting to the um, rather crude tools that we have. And absolutely, and I think one of the things the state can really help on is helping to proactively identify those areas because a lot of times, you know, the, the ag districts, they're worried, they have plenty to worry about and they don't know um, maybe where there's pockets of populations and where they're getting their water source. And so it's not on their radar. Um, you know, it's same with maybe neighboring cities. And I think, you know, as, as different parties are coming together to figure out how to implement the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, having data that identifies in this area, there's really vulnerable populations will really help to make sure that as they're coming together, that's at the forefront, um, at least one of the things on the forefront of um, what collectively we're doing to try and prevent it. So appreciate Great. it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Even though the news is awful, a pleasure seeing you. Uh, next, um, item number five. Those are the done ones. Back. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Marcus, board members. Max Gomberg, uh, returning. <laughs> Uh, we're here to present uh, the... Uh, now, Max, the numbers went way up while you were gone, you know, and then they dropped precipitously when you got back. Is there a linkage? Uh, you know, uh, every time I go to a sporting event um, and the team I'm rooting for wins, I presume there's a linkage. So. <laughs> um, I, I'm here with uh, my colleague uh, Katie Landau. Um, we're going to present to you uh, the, the numbers for uh, January for, for the urban uh, water conservation. And uh, Katie's going to run through the numbers. But uh, before uh, we do that, um, I, I just want to um, talk about sort of uh, an issue that's come up regarding baseline. Um, you know, we've been collecting this data, as you see, for, for eight months now, um, and the regulation runs through April.
April, and of course, on the 17th, we'll be back uh, in front of you with a, a, a proposal for uh, sort of a, a, a new set of, of regulations uh, building on what, what we did last year. Um, but before we get to that, and before we get to the numbers, I just want to talk about uh, an issue that's come up uh, of baselines a little bit, because we, we've gotten a couple comments uh, from, from water districts about, uh, you know, the fact that we chose a 2013 baseline, and particularly for this month, that if we had chosen a different baseline, their numbers would look better. Uh, so, uh, you know, numbers for December. What their number. Worse. That's that's right. Yeah. Um, right. So I, I just want to <laughs> sort of uh, refresh and, and remind everyone and, and uh, why we chose this baseline um, and and to talk about baseline for just a couple minutes. So, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm the, the the climate change person here, um, and it's always my duty to to remind us um, that the, our climate is changing, um, relying on historical data and historical averages is just not an adequate guide uh, uh, going forward into, into the future. And, and that's an important point to keep in mind when we look about how are we, uh, you know, comparing what we're doing in response to this particular drought, but also just looking forward to future droughts because we're going to have more of them. There's a new study out just yesterday from researchers at Stanford um, that really illustrates in a bold way how dry, um, you know, large stretches of our future in California are going to be. So, um, you know, that, that's one thing, you know, because we've, we've gotten some comments that say, well, you know, we should really look back at, you know, the pre-2007 or, you know, the long-term averages. They really bear no, uh, no resemblance to what we're going to see already seeing, it's already emerging, um, regardless of whether you tie the current drought to our changing climate or not. And 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 there are a couple other reasons not to go back this far either. Um, you know, pre-2007, um, we were in a different economy in this state, um, and, and that bubble burst, and uh, we're not going back there. Our water use prior to 2007 wasn't sustainable to begin with, so it's just not, we don't want to go looking back there, and I just want to emphasize that, um, you, you know, in, in response to some of this critique about, well, we need to go back further for, you know, sort of a fair representation of what uh, Harrison years should be. Um, so that's that's the second point. Um, and, and a third point, again, to emphasize, we're not, this is not about making some water districts look good or bad. It's about looking at how we're responding to this drought, you know, after things got bad, which is why we chose 2013. In fact, we had originally chosen actually 2011 through 2013, and we got pushed back on that. People claimed for various reasons that that was inappropriate. We all agreed 2013 would be appropriate. You don't have to worry about changes in population. It's only a year ago. It's a simple, easy to understand thing. And so the fact that we're now getting complaints again uh, is to me a, a little uh, troublesome. Uh, you know. Uh, and and when we look forward to you know what this board may do a uh, sort of a more permanent non-emergency based conservation policy you know we're going to we're going to engage with 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 all the water districts with all the stakeholders and figure out what what's going to make sense the one thing i would point out is you know we have the 20 by 2020 legislation that that also requires uh, a baseline the the manual for for computing that baseline is 100 pages long there are four different options um, that simply wasn't going to work for an emergency regulation um, like what, what we've done here. So uh, again, for, for, for looking forward for something permanent, you know, we're, we're going to engage. But for now, um, the idea that we would change this baseline, I, I think, is really misguided um, and is, is frankly self-serving on, on the, the part of some water districts that just want to look better. Now, one, oh, one question. Yeah. Uh, could we also have like 24? Comparing back to 2014 as well as 2013, I, you know, just add another column. We've already got the 13 column, so uh, so so that because last year and uh, and this year are kind of this is a little bit better in some places and it's equally as bad in other places, and so uh, it, 
you know, I don't know. It just seems to me from a communications perspective, it might be helpful to see how were we this time last year and how are we to our baseline year, which is 2013. Yeah, we could certainly look at that. I don't think we would want to abandon 2013 and shift to 2014, but to look at both years. You know, and, and like you said, we've been collecting the data, so we can. Um, so, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my, my colleague, Mrs. Landau, who will now uh, take you through the numbers. Ms. Landau, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Max, for that opening. Uh, good morning. I just, before we get into the data, I wanted to really emphasize the difference in the climate that we saw in January versus what we saw in December. Um, over the last several months that we've been collecting the data, we have seen a correlation between the climate and the water conservation levels. Mm -hmm. Typically when it's been wetter, we've saved more water, and when it's been drier, our levels have been lower. Um, as you may recall, December was a very wet month, and it also happened to be when we have seen our greatest water con conservation levels to date, 22% statewide, um, where the highest level of savings were achieved in areas where it was both wet and cool. Unfortunately, the rain didn't stick around after the new year, and January was one of the driest on record. Um, this slide shows the climatic differences between 2013, which as Max just talked about, is we're continuing to use as our baseline in the orange, and the January 2015 in the blue. Well, you know, January didn't feel so good in 2013, <laughs> but it's all relative. It, it, right, it wasn't great, but as you can see, it was better than what we just experienced. Um, so on the left, you can see the precipitation, and on the right, you can see the temperature for select cities in the various hydrologic regions. And the general trend statewide is that 2015 was much drier and it was warmer than we have seen for our baseline year, which is something to keep in mind as I present the rest of the conservation numbers. Right, but you know, again, 2013, those numbers are in the single digits in rainfall and precipitation, which is way outside of the normal um, historic record, which is always double digits, uh, or practically always, except the desert areas. So, I mean, this it, you're comparing to a very dry year. Right, but we're going to be seeing more dry years, I, we're, and you know that that's that's our future reality. And so we, we need to, you know, be cognizant of the fact that we can't look back and say, well, w what was normal in the 20th century is not going. You know, the, w what is normal in California d isn't normal. That is, you know, we always have extremes, and we're 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 heading towards more of them. Here's what everybody says about yeah. us. Isn't it awful that it's true? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, well I, I like unique, but you know, unique, yes, unique. <laughs> yeah, the Mike, Mike Anderson's um, climate talk in January pointed that for January that in in the 21st century, Januarys are dry. If you look at if you just parse it out, so we have a whole new hydrologic record to look at in the last couple decades. And Thanks. actually, by comparing 2015 to 2013, where we've seen dry years in general for both, it actually reduces that climatic variability we're seeing in the numbers. So we can actually see a better idea of how successful water conservations actually are in reducing the numbers. It's not necessarily always going to be that climatic driver. So um, regardless of what the weather happens to be, every month we have 411 retail urban water suppliers that are required to submit their monthly production reports. This slide shows the level of reporting compliance since June 2014. A couple of general comments. Over the last eight months, reporting compliance has been outstanding. Of the 411 suppliers that are required to submit reports, they have all submitted at least one report, and the majority of suppliers have submitted reports every month. Um, the red line on this graph shows the percent of suppliers that have submitted the reports for each month. Um, every month that we present the data, it always looks like there's a dip in the compliance rate because uh, for the last several months, you can see we've hovered around the 98, 99% 
reporting level, but now we're down to 92 for January. Uh, I just want to note that there are a handful of suppliers that do not receive the data until after our reporting deadline. Uh, we typically pull the data about a week after the 15th, but some suppliers do submit that data after. Additionally, for this month, we um, there were some reporting problems where some suppliers inadvertently submitted reports for January 2014 instead of 2015. We've contacted those suppliers and they've resubmitted. So those um, 34 reports that we're currently missing in this data set will be represented when we re present in the next month. Um, we are expecting that number, reporting number, to go back up to around that 98% reporting level. If you had 100% um, of uh, reporting, except for the areas that have that uh, timing problem, what would the number look like instead of 92 for January? Uh, we've been hovering around uh, 20 missing reports, so around, you know, the 385, 390 level if we had 100%. Um, those 34 dist uh, suppliers that are missing, they do represent a very small percentage of the state's population that is represented under the urban water suppliers. So them actually missing those reports today has a minimal impact on the results that I'm going to show you. This slide shows the number of water suppliers who have implemented the stage of their water shortage contingency plan that included a mandatory restriction on outdoor water use, which is one of the fundamental requirements of the emergency regulations. Overall, compliance with the mandatory restrictions on outdoor water use is uh, good, but we have seen improvement over time. I do want to just mention again that that 95 compliance rate shown in red on the January columns means that 95% of those 377 reporters that have submitted reports are showing that they are in compliance. We do expect, again, once everyone has submitted those reports, to the compliance rate will go down slightly back to around the low 90s where it's been hovering over the last several months. Our goal with this measure is to ensure that all the suppliers are in compliance with the mandatory water restrictions on outdoor water use and to make sure that suppliers are conserving and using water as efficiently as possible. Determining whether or not the suppliers are in compliance is not always clear. To that end, we are in the process of evaluating the responses that the suppliers have provided. We have sent out compliance letters to suppliers who've indicated that they are not implementing the mandatory restrictions. This slide shows the trend in statewide water production in millions of gallons on a monthly basis for the eight months that we've been tracking the data. Again, 2013 water production is shown in orange and the 2014 and 2015 water production data is shown in blue. Uh, it's important to note that what you're seeing for the 2013 baseline between December and January is not actually a continuous time series. Again, we've moved back to the beginning of January two thousand or of two thousand thirteen. So you're moving you're shifting back twelve months. So while it may look like you know there was a drop in the continuous water production for the baseline, that may not actually have been what was seen on the ground. We have moved back twelve months. Um, however for the 2014-2015, you can see that the water production was significantly higher during the summer months, and we saw a downward trend throughout the fall and the early winter with our lowest water productions to date in December. We did see a 300 million gallon increase in water production between December and January 2015, which was partially expected due to how dry January was. Can I ask a quick Question, Katie, and this is um, embarrassing because I should know the answers. W when we're looking at the chart, mm -hmm. we pulled out our GPCD it, so that we could do comparisons that people could understand, you know, between their neighbors, residential. When we talk about the percentage reductions, and we're going to get to that, we're talking about this produced water number. That includes commercial industrial, or is, are they pulled out? It's these numbers are the total. So it will be commercial industrial. Okay. 
That's right. This is total production. So it's everything that goes from the treatment plant into the system, and it even includes water that's lost before it reaches customer meters as well. So it includes leakage. Okay, okay. great. Thanks. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure as when we're looking at these gross numbers, what do they mean? So there's there's a slight difference when we get into the details and looking at a given place. There percentage reduction could also have to do with the economy or a given industry and commercial, but there are GPCD is more transferable to a comparative purpose. That's correct. So thank you, Chair. Um, so the really significant thing to highlight in this slide is the difference in the water production or how much less water was used for January in 2015 versus 2013. On this graph, that uh, difference is shown between the top of the blue column and the top of the orange column. And this difference is highlighted on this slide, uh, which shows the monthly difference in water production in purple. So for example, in December, the difference between those two columns resulted in 30.6 billion gallons of water saved. That savings decreased significantly to 10.6 billion gallons of water in January. Um, however, cumulatively to date, we have, our conservation efforts ha do mean that we have saved 146.4 billion gallons of water between June 2014 and January 2015. That equates to over 449,000 acre feet of water, which is enough to pro provide 1.96 million Californians for water for one year. This slide shows the water production savings as a percentage comparing the 2014 or 2015 water production, depending on the month, to that 2013 baseline. So how this relates to that previous slide is that the 10.6 billion gallons of water that we saved in January equates to an 8.8% savings between those two years. This slide shows that the we do see a range in variability throughout the year. Our winter um, water savings is much more volatile, you know, the November to January changes. And that's because the winter months are significantly more driven by precipitation than the summer months are. We can have a better idea of our continued water use throughout those summer months. For example, um, the drop and savings that we see between December and January indicates that people were really great about turning off their sprinklers when it was raining in December, which is exactly what we wanted them to do. Right. But once the rain stopped in January, people turned their sprinklers right back on. Do you, do you think, again, this is all guesswork, do you think that's a combination of looking at their dry lawn and the layperson thinking that it, since it rained so much in December, the drought must be over? I think it's a combination of those you, I, two things. You, we have heard a lot, you know, in the newspapers, how the media is presenting it, that in just walking around, you talk to people and they go, oh, it rained, we're good, excellent. Um, those two, you know, those two things you just mentioned, it does highlight how important the water conservations of individual Californians, such as turning off your sprinklers when your lawn looks brown, are in achieving our water conservation goals. And it also shows that individually, we must make a concerted effort to cut back our water use even more as we move on into this next year. Whether that's by changing our irrigation practices, such as letting our lawns go brown in the winter months, or making a more permanent change to native landscaping, we must adapt our actions to what may be our new climate normal. This slide shows the water conservation production savings by hydrologic region for January. When you look at the January's uh, water production savings by hydric legion, hydrologic region as it's shown here with the, again, 2013 in orange and the 2015 in blue, you can see that the savings is not consistent through the hydrologic regions. The percent reduction for January is shown in the purple line. The hydrologic region with the lowest level of savings is shown on the left, and the level of savings increases as you move towards the right. On the last slide, we saw that the statewide savings in water production for January was 8.8, .8, and that is represented on this graph in that red dashed line. 
Seven of the 10 hydrologic regions showed a decrease in water productions for January as compared to their savings in December. Again, the savings or this decrease was due to the lack of rain and it's particularly evident in the San Francisco Bay region where there was practically no measurable precipitation in January and we see a drop from the 21.6% water savings they had in December down to 3.7 this year. I also want to note that the South Coast hydrologic region, although it decrease, their savings levels decrease to 9.2 this year. The South Coast does represent 60% of our total water use, and that 9.2% savings does equate to over 6.6 .6 billion gallons of water that the South Coast was able to save 2015 compared to 2013. This slide is similar to something that LADWP staff showed at the last board meeting. Um, it shows the total urban water production by hydrologic region for the eight months that we have been collecting the data. The pie chart on the left shows the percent water use by hydrologic region for June 2014 through January 2015, and the table on the right shows both the percent water use and the percent population served by hydrologic region for the eight month period of record. So what this, uh, while well, the previous slide showed that for this January, the South Coast represented 60% of the all water use, this slide shows that for that eight month period, the South Coast has used 53% of all water for the state, but they're using that water to serve 56% of the state's population. In addition to the South Coast, two other hydrologic regions, the San Francisco Bay and the Central Coast, have been able to achieve a lower percent water use than the percent population that they serve for those eight months. Uh, these three hydrologic regions are highlighted on the table. And combined, the three hydrologic regions have used 69% of the water, serving 78% of the state's population. Does this include, com oh, go ahead. Go ahead. does this include commercial? Yes, this is total water. So it's the residential and that commercial combined. Interesting. Uh, moving on to the residential gallons per capita per day. So this is that total water production number that we receive as that we multiply then by the percent residential population that is provided by all of the suppliers. Um, we've been collecting this data since October. For January, the highest RGCP we saw for the suppliers was 342. Um, if you remember, we saw a high in December of 330, but this is still significantly down from what we saw during the summer months when we were hovering in the high 500s. The lowest RGPCD for January was 37, and although it is slightly higher than what we saw last month, it is still very good. The average uh, January RGPCD was 73, which was up slightly from, again, 67, which we saw in December. So. However, these numbers are still very close to what the performance standard for indoor water use is, which is 55 gallons per capita per day. And 50 suppliers that represent approximately 4.6 million people were able to achieve this and reported less than that 55 gallons total water use. So not just that res residential, but that total water use was less than 55 gallons per day for January. Uh, we have said all along that the high RGPCD numbers and a low percent conservation level raise some questions about how successful our conservation efforts have been. And we are interested in identifying the, these areas to identify why we're not seeing the conservation levels that we would like to see. For January, there were a number of suppliers that had a negative percent reduction or indicates that they actually used more water this year than they have for 2013. And they had a high RGCPD. Again, we are taking into account the fact that it was a very dry month and so we do expect those numbers to shift back down if if we get more rain. Um, 
This slide shows the overall trends in the statewide gallons per capita per day data for June 2014 through January 2015. As I mentioned before, we've seen an overall downward trend for the total ur urban water or the total water use as well as the RGCPD as we moved into the cooler months and we saw the late lowest statewide average RGCDP DP for December where we saw that small increase back up to 73 for January. This slide shows the per capita data by hydrologic region. We've been showing you this slide ever since we started collecting the data. The purple line shows the percent reduction in total water use for January as, as it compares to 2013. And the hydrologic regions are ranked from left to right with the lowest percent reduction on the left and the highest percent reduction on the right. If you look at the hydrologic regions that had the higher percent savings for January, uh, North Coast, Tulare Lake, South Lahontan, San Joaquin River, they all generally have a lower RGCPD value associated with their higher savings. Um, the one outlier here is the Colorado River, which saw a almost doubling of their conservation levels for the month. They went from 6.3 last month up to 12.3, which is significant improvement. But they are still seeing a very high RGCPD, and it's actually the highest for the state this month. Although um, overall the, higher, the numbers are slightly higher for January, those three hydrologic regions that I mentioned earlier that supply 78% of the state with their water, San Francisco Bay, South Coast, and the Central Coast have a combined average RCGDP of 65, which is, yeah. it's great, and it's only slightly over our you know, target goal for the entire state. This slide is just another way to look at the RGPCD data by breaking the, in, the data out by statewide population and showing how the population fits in terms of per capita water use. So what we're seeing here is that 13% of the state's population or 4.6 million people are achieving that indoor water use target of 55 gallons per water per day. The majority of the state's population, around 68%, have a total water use that is between 55 and 100 gallons per person per day. And then you have a small portion of that state, that top you know, 5%, that are using more than 150 gallons per day. Uh, we really need to start focusing our education and our outreach and our compliance efforts with that top portion of the population who are using more than you know, 110 gallons or double than our target to improve our overall water conservation and reduce our water use. For the, that low portion of our water conservers, we do try to highlight some of the noteworthy conservation accomplishments every month. This slide shows the 19 water suppliers that were able to achieve 20% or greater levels of water conservation and had a per capita use of less than 60 gallons for the month of January. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Max. Can we go back to that one for a second? I like this sort of little Hall of Fame one. Just want to like look at it a little bit. We have a, a nice geographic spread here: Central Valley, Southern California, North Coast, um, Central Coast communities, and of course, Some of those are Bay drops area. from earlier in the year. Even cool. Thank you. Just wanted a chance to see it. So as I mentioned at the outset, uh, in another two weeks, we're going to be back before the board with uh, a proposal for the next round of uh, emergency regulations. And uh, we should have that proposal out for public review uh, by the end of the week, by the end of Friday. 
Uh, so for those looking for what's actually going to be in it, <laughs> um, it to, uh, keep checking back with us uh, towards the end of the week. Uh, and the only other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, you know, this is something that uh, Board Member Diadamo had had asked about um, way back uh, in in the fall about developing some type of uh, number and uh, you know other contact methods, web contact methods for people to, uh, you know, if they if they can't uh, get in touch with their water supplier or they're somewhere else to be able to just uh, you know phone in or report uh, water waste that they've observed um, that would allow us centrally to, uh, you know, then send send a letter out to the uh, alleged water waster and, and make sure that they're aware uh, that they may have a leak or their sprinklers are watering the, the road or, or what, what have it, what have you. So um, th that's under development and we will continue to provide updates to the board as we move that along. And I, I want to thank you, uh, Katie, uh, particularly for uh, putting in the um, uh, population uh, mm -hmm. slides that uh, that Penny uh, had from uh, uh, from LADWP. I I think it it helps it helps put in context. It's not that everybody has a lot more to do. <laughs> there is no one who's getting off uh, on this, but. Uh, it's a heavy lift in the South Coast because there's so many people. And so uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, and along those lines, that chart, um, first of all, I think that you guys are doing a great job and um, just staying the course and seeing what we can do to improve this um, it is an absolute must. Um, every time you do these presentations, though, it's interesting, I end up with uh, kind of just more thoughts, not necessarily that we need to change things, but it just causes me to think, well, what about this one factor or whatever? So looking at the population chart, and um, th this includes commercial, correct? So um, I'd be curious to see, I mean, I've, I've always um, heard, I don't know that this is a fact, that the agricultural areas, of course, have food processing, and so there's high water use in those areas. Um, but I don't know that, um, in fact, that is uh, true for the entire state, that the agricultural areas um, are higher water users in the commercial sector. I suspect it's the case. But I, I think it'd be uh, useful uh, maybe to, to work with um, Aqua and um, uh, some of the other um, entities, the food processing, uh, the League of California Food Processors, Manufacturers Council, other entities uh, that are involved in uh, commercial production, and try and, you know, maybe th they would have uh, readily available data that could help us to overlie this information um, with uh, locations of uh, uh, commercial um, entities, just to help put it in better perspective, not to do something different. And then um, on gallons per capita per day, I should know this, but that is based upon uh, what size um, family, what size household. Doesn't matter. It's calculated by the total population, so it's not looking at a household number. So it's saying if you're using 55 gallons per capita per day, each person in your household, no matter how big the house, is using those 55 gallons. Right, so then that's by region. Uh, we're showing it by, uh, we have the statewide. So statewide, every person for January was using 73 gallons per person per day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as an average. Um, and then this slide shows the hydrologic, the average for the hydrologic regions. And right, as Felicia is showing that, um, that PDF does show the breakdown for the RGCPD for each of the four, uh, 377 suppliers that submitted data for January. Right, okay. Uh, this just reminds me of a conversation I had with Eric about uh, gallons per capita per day, and um, and I think you're headed in this direction anyway. But just to make it um, easier for the average um, uh, retail consumer to understand um, uh, when they look at their bill, and to be able to uh, figure it out. Um, uh, after we had our conversation, I looked at my bill and. Uh, 
uh, unless you're in this field, <laughs> uh, you can't figure it out. Yeah, it really depends on your water agency right. and how much information they give they you. They provide it's, you. Some do a great job of doing it even without the, you know, some have the computerized telemeter system that can give it to you in real time. But even in Australia, they did what they called smart bills, which gave them the comparison, kind of like we get, I don't know if you get it in your energy bill. I get it in my right. energy bill where I can compare what I did last year the same Time. Yeah, just to add, to, I, there's a wide range in terms of uh, the sophistication of billing systems, uh, you know, across all of these urban water suppliers. So some have the ability, they have the software to be able to put a lot of information on the bill, and and some, you know, really need the technical and financial assistance, or you know, need to get there um, to to do that. So. You know that that is an area where where we definitely want to focus and figure out what is it that collectively, not not just the board, but collectively, the state can do to really support um, you know that type of full full information billing, if you will. Uh, you know, there's some many water suppliers, even larger ones, they only bill once every other month. Right. So right. you know, we we've got a ways to go. <laughs> Hey, um, one thing, Max, thank you for your discussion on the baseline debate and all that. And I think, um, you know, based on some of, each month we're talking about this and the importance that you brought up in your presentation about performance standards and how, you know, maybe we're, are we at that point as we consider um, uh, reaffirming the regulations to bring forward more performance standards as opposed to percent reductions from baseline. And, you know, we bring up the indoor uh, standard, um, but then there are also, um, we have a lot more information now to look at whether outdoor standards are appropriate uh, that are regionally based, as my fellow board members have brought up. Um, could you comment on that as we go forward? Because I agree with your points that we're, I think it's a waste of time to debate and, and wring our hands too much over what baseline is versus what uh, folks sh uh, should expect that they're meeting a performance standard that's appropriate for where they live in California. Yeah, so I want to make the distinction between emergency regulations, which is what we've got in place now and we'll be addressing on the 17th, and then the potential for a uh, what you could consider a, a permanent conservation policy from this board with, with performance standards. And I think, you know, that's going to take more time to develop, but that, again, would not just be a 270-day uh, set of regulations. That would be a, a, a permanent and ongoing way to set standards um, and and make sure that that you know beyond 2020, you know we're, we are still going on water conservation. But that discussion really entails working with our, our sister agencies, with the Department of Water Resources, with the Public Utilities Commission, um, and and with the administration, and to figure out how we do that. And of course, with with our stakeholder community as well. So I think that's we absolutely need to be able to set, uh, you know, easy to understand, fair, equitable performance standards. We're not going to be doing that in this emergency regulation uh, setting, but we, we do want to make that happen. So Max and Katie, I don't want to put you on the spot here, and I'm going to ask you to do something that you should never, ever, ever do in general for somebody. Um, unsolicited, but I want you to tell me how to feel about these numbers. Just don't tell me how to feel generally, and or don't tell your loved ones how to feel, but um, I mean, at first blush, it's the drop is disappointing. I chose to be optimistic in December, even though I knew it was wet, and I thought, well, these people, as Katie said, are making a decision to turn their sprinklers off, and that's something. Um, but I'm not quite, I'm still not quite sure how to feel about the drop. You know, part of it just says folks look at their lawns and they just can't bear them being brown or something because they clearly weren't brown by January because they got so much rain in December. And so I'm not quite sure what to make of it. And I do think that's important as we look at how much more we need to ring the bell um, in moving forward as we consider what to do on the 17th and beyond. 
Well, the way I look at it is, you know, we, we've had this regulation in place since the end of July, and we've been collecting data back to June, and, and uh, you know, Katie showed a slide. Over the, the entire time, you know, it's 146 billion gallons. Um, that were not consumed, um, you know, either. Good you, but that's right. So, so feel good about that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I think you know it is hard to overstate the severity of of the drought we're in. Um, you know, this is year four. Uh, you know, we have dismal snowpack. Our reservoirs are low. Uh, our groundwater basins are depleted. Uh, communities are out of water. Um, farmland is being fallowed and people are out of work. I, it, it is a really uh, dismal situation. Um, you know, thankfully in our cities, uh, for the most part, uh, we are not where uh, some other countries are, <laughs> where uh, very large cities um, are literally, uh, you know, on the, on the brink of being out of water and, and are rationed. Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking specifically of Sao Paulo and Brazil, um, but there are other places around the globe as well. So, uh, you know, it, it could be worse. Um, if it doesn't rain next winter, it will be worse, and that is still a possibility. Um, you know, we're simply at a point where we just can't count on it raining. So, um, I, you know, it, people responded well. We we did messaging. We have our Save Our Water campaign, um, and it's hard to su sustain a sense of urgency and emergency, <laughs> uh, you know, for, for a, a longer period of time, but. Unfortunately, we don't have a choice. We have to, you know, redouble the efforts. I mean, collectively, all of us, because, you know, water conservation is an area where the the individual decisions add up. Right? It, it really does matter what each person does in his or her household, um, in in the garden, you know, even you know, commercial uh, enterprises, industry. Uh, it all matters. All those drops add up because the more water we keep in our reservoirs, in our groundwater basins, um, you know, the, the, the more resilient we are to, uh, you know, a, a really prolonged and, and severe drought. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a dire situation. Um, you know, overall, it's been, I, I think, a pretty good effort uh, over the last eight months. Um, it needs to continue, uh, and, and, and that's sort of how I think of it. I, so maybe that doesn't quite get to no, answering your question, but. No, that's very thoughtful and well said. Thank you, Max. I do, I do think it's challenging. I mean, my, my one uh, pause on alarm, ringing every alarm bell in my body, is the fact that I think people may have thought that with all that rain in December, the drought must be over. We live in this space all the time and know it's absolutely not. And we do see those uh, terrible impacts in rural and agricultural communities and communities running out of water that we talked about earlier um, today. And people in big urban centers just don't because they're hundreds of miles away. And so it behooves us, but also in particular behooves local water agencies and wholesalers to to ring the bell because the idea of us running out of water or getting in as dire straits as Sao Paulo and other places is, is just not acceptable. So I, the, the question as we move towards the 17th, and I, we'll hear from some speakers that'll uh, probably give us a little guidance in how they look at these numbers are that we, we just have to look at it uh, very seriously at the very least as a messaging exercise and um, at most as what is the the next appropriate step at a state level, knowing that our ultimate goal is we want local agencies to be going to town on this because they're the ones who are in relationship and communication with their customers. We aren't. Right. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is, we have to continue sending the message, you know, that the, the opportunity to, to save still exists, right? If you, if you weren't able to switch to drought tolerant landscaping last year, or if you weren't able to fix that irrigation system, now is the time. Thank you very, very much. A oh, couple speakers, or Kate, did you want to ask? Uh, just well, to add, you know, well, I totally agree with Max that we do need to, you know, stay on message. You do need to save as much water as possible. There are areas where we are seeing improvement. I mean, if you look actually back at this graph, you can see that San Francisco Bay, although we saw a drastic reduction in their total savings for the month of January, they are at 56 
gallons per right. capita per day. So they are one gallon over our tar target for, and this is total water that, or that savings, you know, was 3.7, but they are using 56 gallons per capita per day for residential use when our indoor target is 55. So there are areas, and North Coast isn't that far behind, there are areas, and the majority of the state is in the mid-70s for our residential gallons. So we are conserving, we are doing a good job, not to say there isn't room for improvement, and depending on how you know the rain falls or doesn't, it will become more or less, well, it will still continue to be incredibly important that people conserve. Yeah, my concern is that that curve goes, uh, I mean, the real comparison is gonna be January of this year through June, and then when it gets hot through the summer, will we be back to normal, or will people have lowered their basic level of engagement? So. And, and you know, as I mentioned, there is greater volatility in your water usage during the winter months because it is so precipitation-driven. We, you know, will be expecting to see a hopefully a small increase as we get back into the warmer months. Yeah. But if we can see just a general reduction versus the you know, once we get past June, the 2014 numbers, that would be ideal. All right. All right. Thank you. Thoughtful. Um, we have a couple of speaker cards. Dave Bowen. Look forward to hearing from you from Aqua. Thank you, Chairperson Marcus and Chair mem or Board Members. David Boland, Association of California Water Agencies. I uh, just had a couple of remarks this time, uh, just the perceptions, how we should feel, I guess. Uh, again, uh, the danger of managing month to month and managing based on weather as opposed to climate, as opposed to trends. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, again, context is everything. Uh, one, one thing that does strike us uh, as we look at the precipitation patterns in December is it was heavier in the north and less heavy in the south. Um, and that could have, uh, and that may have contributed to the January situation where it was dry everywhere. Uh, as a matter of fact, almost as dry as it's ever been uh, this last January. Uh, and, and again, looking at uh, year over year, 2013 uh, to 2014 and then 2015, uh, again, the trends are really important that we are seeing uh, across all the hydrologic regions uh, a, a lowering of per capita use. So I think those are important things to keep in mind and the fact that um, Although people are irrigating in Southern California in the winter uh, because they do have landscaping and because they didn't get any rain uh, and or got just a normal year's rain in December in Southern California, not the torrential rains we got up here in one month, um, we got almost the, the entire winter's rainfall in just December here in Northern California, but we've had some unseasonably dry months up to that. And of course, since then, uh, as a matter of fact, it's looking pretty bad here, uh, even looking forward into March. And um, so I, I guess the idea is we need to stay the course. We are staying the course. I think the water agencies are continuing to, to uh, communicate well. We are seeing some good compliance numbers. Again, uh, uh, we are seeing the, the, the top come down, which is a good thing. Uh, those extreme numbers on per capita use are, um, are being mitigated in most places of the state. And, uh, and again, I think the, the overall uh, trend is continuing to look good. Uh, one uh, significant clarification I think I need to make for water agencies is the fact that uh, in, in our understanding and based on the aqua letter, uh, there is no ask to change the baseline. The, the baseline is 2013. Uh, Aqua continues to support 2013 as a baseline. We want to see that going forward. We don't want 2014 to be, we don't want to recalibrate and then, you know, change the goalposts. Right. Um, but I don't think that was ever considered by the board or staff. And so we didn't really Some major on that point. Ask. Some Pardon? folks in their comments did ask. Or yeah, th there may have been some individual agencies who, uh, for positioning purposes, may want to see different uh, numbers. The baseline, though, the position that we have is that the baseline has been established. What we did ask for was some context, and we think we're going to provide that context whether or not the board chooses to um, to develop a, a, a additional column on 2007 numbers. Uh, we think 2007 is actually a good year for some context for recent progress that's been made in water conservation. Uh, it basically, a relatively normal rainfall year, a relatively normal economic situation, uh, 
at the end of the, the boom cycle and the beginning of the bust cycle and pre-drought. And so again, we made the case that it might be helpful to have those numbers for comparison purposes or contrast uh, to, uh, or not contrast, but comparison, I guess, as to how well uh, 